So it's a pleasure to have here today Lara Nava. In English, no? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, it is a pleasure. It will be a pleasure also in French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lara, uh, she got the PhD in, uh, in Italy, in Milan, and after that she she did a number of, of postdocs, including two Marie Curie fellowships, one in Israel and one in uh, Italy. And she was also here as a postdoc in 2011 and 2013. She's a recognized expert in gamma ray bursts and also cosmic ray physics. And today, and she was visiting here as for two months with a program from the University of uh, Paris Cité for uh, as a visiting researchers. Unfortunately, the two months are almost gone and she will stay until uh, Thursday. Yes. And she will, today she will talk us about uh, very high energy emission in gamma ray bursts. Okay, thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. Uh, yes, today I will give you an overview of very high energy emission detected from gamma ray burst. So I will explain why it is important. Uh, this emission has been discovered only a few years ago, so it's something quite new. And I will explain why it's important in the gamma ray burst field, but also in other fields of astrophysics and particle physics or fundamental physics. I will start with the introduction on gamma ray bursts, also for non-experts of the field. So uh, this is a general picture that we use to uh, explain the emission that we receive from gamma ray bursts. So here you can see uh, what we call the central engine of gamma ray bursts. In this case, what you can see here is a massive star and the core of the star has collapsed. Uh, forming a central black hole surrounded by a, an accretion disk. Here you can see the uh, envelope of the star that is still there and later will uh, produce a supernova explosion. So this is the um, central engine and the progenitor um, explaining long gamma repulse, which are a class of the main class of gamma repulse. Then we also have another class called short gamma ray bursts because the duration of the emission is short, is shorter than two seconds. And in this case, um, this um, central engine should be replaced with a, a binary a neutron star system or binary system composed by a neutron star and the black hole. And again, when the merger of this um, binary system occurs, you will have something similar the formation of a black hole surrounded by an accretion disk. So in both cases, the accretion of this matter here will trigger the formation and launch of two collimated, highly relativistic jets. And these jets, uh, the matter will be accelerated to very large velocities. So it's difficult to estimate the bulk Lorentz factor of the jet, but estimates are always around the gamma 100 to 1000 in the most extreme cases. So it's an ultra relativistic uh, jet. And at some distance from the central engine, which is not well constrained, but it's uh, around 10 to the 13, 10 to the 15 centimeters. We have the production of soft gamma ray radiation, and this phase of the emission is called the prompt emission. Um, so what we see is the emission of radiation with this typical energy spectrum. So as you can see, the radiation is mostly in the range 10 keV to about 10 MeV. Uh, the spectrum is non-thermal. It has a peak here. Um, in this case, it's just below one, one MeV, but more typical values are here, about 200 keV. And uh, it's described by a power law below this peak energy and another power law uh, at higher energies. Uh, these are examples of light curves. You can see here the light curve from six different gamma ray bursts. So these, uh, uh, there is no standard light curve. You can have one single peak or two well separated episodes or more complex light curves. So here the flux shows a large uh, variability. 
variability can be as short as 10 milliseconds. And uh, so each variables have very different properties, temporal properties during the um, prompt emission. Um, the duration, the total duration of this emission is typically around 20 seconds for long gamma ray bursts, but it can last also for several minutes. While for short gamma ray bursts, the duration, the whole duration of the prompt emission is shorter than two seconds. So how this emission is produced? We believe that it's produced after dissipation of the energy that occurs um, within the jet. So we need a mechanism to convert a fraction of the jet energy into internal energy of the particles, and then uh, electrons, the accelerated electrons are expected to produce this uh, gamma ray um, radiation. So there are two mechanisms involved to do that. One is uh, internal shocks. So in case the energy of the jet is carried mostly by the particles, then we expect to extract this energy uh, by collisions between different parts of the jet that maybe move to slightly different velocities. So at some point they collide and, and producing this dissipation of energy. The other possibility, if the jet is uh, magnetically dominated, um, instead is to dissipate energy to the um, reconnection of magnetic field lines. So two very different scenarios, uh, but in both cases, we expect to have here uh, accelerated particles, so a non-thermal population of electrons in a strong magnetic field. So we expect to see a strong um, synchrotron uh, radiation. So there are different open issues in all this um, interpretation of prompt emission from the monitors. As I said, we see has not identified the dissipation mechanism, uh, the nature of the variability, the properties of the emitting region. So uh, the value, for example, of the magnetic field in the region where the radiation is produced, or at which distance from the central energy this radiation is produced. And unfortunately, we still don't know what is the radiative mechanism. So I mentioned synchrotron radiation, but actually there is a problem with this interpretation. So if we have a population of electrons that have been accelerated into a power law of thermal distribution from some minimum Lorentz factor to a maximum one with a um, spectral index minus p, which is as uh, supposed to be between two and three, we expect to have a synchrotron radiation where um, electrons with this energy will produce a synchrotron um, photon energy here that is responsible for the peak of the spectrum. Then you see that at higher energies, we expect to have a photon index that depends on the spectral index of the electron population. And at lower energies, we see radiation from those electrodes that are cooling. So electrons here will lose energy and go to lower uh, um, Lorentz factor and radiate synchrotron photons uh, that uh, are responsible for this part of the spectrum. So now I will remove the electron spectrum because I want to compare the observed spectrum in gamma ray bursts with the um, what expectations from synchrotron fields. So from the comparison, you see that what we detect usually with our uh, instruments um, is this part of the spectrum here, so around the peak energy. And here you immediately have two uh, consequences. First, that if we measure in our spectra, the spectral index here, we can infer the value of the um, electron spectrum, uh, the spectral index of the electron population P. And the other one is that below the peak, we have a strong um, prediction for the expected slope of our observed spectrum. 
So it should be minus 1.5. So when we give the value of photon spectra, we refer to this notation here. So the spectrum in photons per Earth per centimeter second. So alpha refers to the slope of the spectrum here. But when we plot the spectrum, we multiply by mu squared. Okay, so there is this inconsistency, apparent inconsistency between the, the plot and the value that can give it by this iteration. Okay, so we expect to measure minus 1.5. But actually, if we compare with what we observe from gamma ray bursts, the typical spectrum of gamma ray bursts is harder. So the typical photon index is around minus one, so inconsistent with what we expect from synchrotron radiation. And this is very uh, a robust problem uh, that has not been really solved so far. There is a huge literature about this. I just mentioned here a few papers. In some cases, people try to modify the synchrotron radiation to explain the harder spectrum. In other cases, just consider different uh, models, so alternatives to the synchrotron uh, scenario. And of course, as you can understand, the fact that we do not understand the emission here, what is the process that is producing these photons, uh, means that we are not able to constrain the properties of the emitting region and uh, discriminate between a magnetic model or a matter-dominated model for the jet. So it's really a hot topic in uh, gamma ray burst physics. And uh, we recently uh, did some uh, progress into this topic. So we analyzed Gamma ray burst spectra acting data at lower energies. This is possible sometimes, not very often, thanks to the XRT telescope on board SWIFT that usually is not able to detect prompt emission from gamma ray bursts because it needs some time to slew and um, point to the gamma ray burst. So usually when he <clears throat> points to gamma ray bursts, the prompt emission is over. But in some cases, instead, XRT was already looking at the gamma burst during the prompt emission, and we can study the prompt emission spectrum down to uh, 0.3 keV. And we discovered that there is a break in the spectrum, so the slope here below the peak does not continue with the same photon index, but there is a break to a harder, um, to a harder power law. These, we confirm this also with GBM data. So this is a gamma ray burst detected by Fermi GBM. And also here you see that you need a, to have a harder power law here at low energy, a break that in this case is about uh, 50 keV, and, uh, and then the usual peak energy. Okay, so. What is this break? So here again, some uh, fit, uh, this time with the synchrotron model. So we don't fit an empirical function, but we directly fit a synchrotron spectrum to the data. And again, you see that the fit uh, is able to um, explain this happening here. And uh, we also have the optical data that are available all, only for a bunch of cases because to have optical data simultaneous to the prompt emission is very difficult in the universe. Uh, but as you can see, it, it is consistent uh, with the spectrum uh, model with the synchrotron component. Okay, so this break here is interpreted at the cooling uh, frequency um, of the synchrotron spectrum. So what does it mean? So I said before that these electrons cool down to very small energies and in the meantime, they radiate. So if the cooling is very efficient, they will uh, fastly reach very small energies. But if the cooling is slower, then they stop at a higher energy. And we see this break here in within the energy range uh, of our telescopes. 
Okay, so this is uh, the interpretation of this break here and the power law below the break and above the break that we measure from the spectra is consistent with expectation from the synchrotron theory. Okay, so seems like a big step forward, but actually there is a problem with this interpretation because the fact that electrons do not cool uh, fast enough means that the magnetic field is smaller than we thought. So if the magnetic field is smaller, it takes more time to electrons to cool to low energy, and then we can see this uh, uh, cooling frequency in X-rays. But the small magnetic field means a very large inverse quantum luminosity. So here you can see uh, this equation that shows the, the expected ratio between an inverse quantum um, luminosity and the synchrotron luminosity. So we expect that electrons that are producing the, the synchrotron photons will also upscatter the synchrotron photons to higher energy producing a synchrotron uh, self-quantum component. And this luminosity, uh, compared to the luminosity of the synchrotron component, is predicted by this equation. Actually, here, it's a simple equation that assumes a Thomson regime. Actually, we know that uh, then we, we need to um, consider klein machine regime, but this is good enough to show that for, short, for uh, small values of the magnetic field, we are increasing the expected luminosity of this component that should uh, be detected at higher energies. So far with LAT observations, so in the GEV range, we didn't detect clearly a uh, inverse Compton emission component. So we can put limits on the luminosity of this inverse Compton component. And uh, you see that in order to have a small quantum uh, factor, we need to increase the radius where this radiation is produced. So this detection of the cooling frequency on one side is giving us the possibility to constrain all these parameters, but the parameters that we obtain are a bit weird. So for example, the radius is supposed to be at least 10 to the 16 centimeters. That is a problem for gamma ray bursts because at this radius, for example, we are not able to explain the variability that we see from gamma ray burst. And at this radius, the um, collision with the external medium uh, becomes important that I will explain in the next slide. So as you see, this is the value of the magnetic field that we infer. So around 10, 30 Gauss, it was supposed to be 10 to the four Gauss. And, um, and in order to avoid this huge uh, luminosity, we need to move the region at very large distances. Okay, so of course, this is done by um, just because we know that there is no huge inverse Compton component in high energies, but of course, to have observations of what happens at high energies, very high energy, what we expect to have this inverse Compton luminosity would be very important to improve these constraints. Okay, so what happens at larger radii, 10 to the 16 centimeter? Uh, now the collisions with the external medium, with the matter present in the external medium becomes important. The jets start to decelerate due to this continuous collision with the external medium and eventually will become non relativistic. In this collision, the radiation at lower frequencies, so typically X rays, soft X rays, uh, optical in radio is produced. And uh, this emission uh, is called afterglow emission. So the situation is this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Here we have different um, examples of what happens during this phase. So we mostly see detection in soft X-ray, optical and radio, and sometimes also in the GED range. The duration is much longer than the front, and we can detect this radiation for days or weeks or even months. The light curves are well described by power law or broken power law, so the flux decays in time smoothly without the strong variability characterizing prompt emission. 
And uh, here you can see example of optical light curves, X-ray afterglow light curves, radio, and here GV light curves detected by the lab on board the uh, film. Okay, so how they are interpreted? So we need to consider here the Z in orange, which is expanding into the external medium, still with the ultra relativistic velocity. The jet will drive a forward shot into the external medium, collecting particles that are present in the external environment, and we accelerate these particles. So in this region here, we expect to have non-thermal accelerated electrons and a strong magnetic field. And again, we expect to see synchrotron radiation. And this is the way after glow radiation from radio to GV is uh, explained. Okay, also here, we uh, can imagine that these electrons will also upscatter the synchrotron photons producing a inverse quantum or synchrotron self quantum component at higher energies in the GV, GV, TV energy range. So this model is solid. This is model for afterglow emission. We don't have all these open issues like in prompt uh, um, emission, but uh, the problem here is that uh, um, we are still not at the point to use after remission to learn about all the physics involved in this process. So the resulting emission that we see from radio to GV energy will depend on the properties of the jet, like energy and bulk Lorentz factor that we would like to measure, will depend on the density of the external medium, which means the environment where the progenitor of long and short gamma ray bursts explode, and uh, uh, will depend, will be mediated by the um, physics of ultra relativistic shocks. Okay, so for example, their uh, efficiency in accelerating electrons, um, their, their efficiency in amplifying the magnetic field, uh, the resulting spectrum of the accelerated particles. So a lot of physics there, and we would like to constrain all these quantities, but since there are many unknowns, um, and many degeneracies among these quantities, we usually are unable to derive constraints on all these physical parameters. So again, observations in this um, TV domain will help us to put more constraints. So what is the status of observations at very high energies? So until 2019, um, there were no detections by um, atmospheric, imagine atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes, which are the telescopes that are sensitive in this energy range. Uh, so they observed the variables for many years without uh, um, finding any hint of detection. Uh, but then uh, in the last year, we, um, we detected four gamma ray bursts with IACT plus one very recent with LASO in the, uh, the last month. So in total, we have five gamma bursts detected at energies larger than 100 GeV. Um, what is the relevance of these very energy observations? Well, as I said in the introduction, so they will be very important for the prompt emission to understand finally what is the mechanism producing prompt radiation where this radiation is produced, what are the properties of the emitting region. For the after remission, we like us to constrain all the model parameters and finally learn about the environment of gamma ray bursts or particle acceleration in these uh, relativistic shots and the properties of the jet. And uh, they can also be used to constrain to the other model, Lorentz and variant variant relation, the intergalactic magnetic field, non-conventional particle physics, and other um, interesting uh, physics, as I will explain at the end. Okay, so this table summarizes the four gamma ray bursts detected by IACT. So two have been detected by MAGIC and the other two by the S telescope. Uh, 
So here there are already few surprises because if you look at the energy of the gamma ray burst, this is the energy emitted during the front and gives you an idea of how strong, how energetic was this gamma ray burst. Three of them have an energy that is uh, about 10 to the fifth degree Earth, uh, which is more than the average. So these were energetic gamma ray bursts, not extreme, but in any case, very energetic compared to the whole population. But in one case, there was also a sub-energetic gamma ray burst, 10 to the fifth year is a small value for a typical gamma ray burst. So it means that very energy radiation can be produced also by gamma ray bursts that are not so energetic. The redshift is another surprise. The average redshift of gamma ray bursts is around two. And uh, we were expecting to detect gamma ray bursts on, only from the nearest one because extragalactic background light will um, affect the flux of TV photons. So TV photons will interact while traveling from the source to Earth, interact with uh, extragalactic background light. Um, yeah, with the extra galactic background light. And when the redshift is large, you will expect a very strong attenuation of this flux. Uh, but as you can see, we detected gamma ray bursts also at redshift 1.1, 0.6, 0 0.4, which are already quite large. The attenuation of the, the TV flux here is already huge. Um, like uh, at one TV, at this redshift, we expect an attenuation of a factor of 300. And still, we were able to detect this emission. It means that this emission is intrinsically bright. Uh, at which time was uh, detected this emission? So in a couple of cases, just one minute after the beginning of the prompt. But in two cases, several hours after the prompt. So several hours after the beginning of the prompt, this emission was still so bright to be uh, detected. And here you can see the energy range where the emission has been detected. So uh, this case here, of a very nearby gamma reverse detected by ESP, the energy of the detected photon reached Three, uh, around three uh, TV, very, very large. Okay, so these are the light curves of this gamma ray burst, only three of them, because for uh, the second magic gamma ray burst, we still don't have public data. So we know only that it has been detected. So here you can see in green, the TV light curve detected by magic. And here for this gamma ray burst detected by S, we have only one point. And for the other gamma ray burst detected by S, we have the light curve over three consecutive nights here in red. So as you can see, uh, we can already draw several conclusions. First of all, in all these cases, the emission is clearly associated to the afterglow phase because the prompt ended here and the magic light curve is here. The prompt in this case ended here. And the prompt is not shown here, but it's here at the beginning. So this emission is clearly associated with the afterglow. Um, this is also um, confirmed by the shape of the light curve, the flux in the period decays at the power law and smooth rate in time. And the other surprise is that the flux is similar to the flux emitted in the X ray range. Here you see in blue the X30 light curve, 1 to 10 TV. Here the X30 light curve is in gray, and here in blue. So the energy that is at TV in the TV domain is comparable to the energy emitted at lower and at lower frequencies. So it's not something negligible. Here you can see the spectra. These are magic spectra for one gamma ray burst divided into five, in five time beams. These are the X spectra uh, for another gamma ray burst. So uh, the uh, photon index is smaller, in all cases, it's smaller than minus two. 
Okay, these are the SEDs. So what about the interpretation? Of course, we need to uh, put maybe energy data together with other, other multi-wavelength observations. Uh, in this magic gamma reverse, the emission was interpreted as synchrotron radiation from X-ray to GV, and then synchrotron set quantum emission to explain the uh, magic observations. Here are, these are two SEDs at two different times. And these are interpretation um, performed by different uh, authors, but on, on, on the, always with the same model. So you see that the two forms bring kinetic energy. The fraction of energy dissipated at the shock and used to accelerate electrons, so it's about a few percent. Uh, the fraction of energy dissipated that goes into the magnetic field, so it's around 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, much smaller than what we thought before. We always thought that the typical value for this parameter is like 1%, 10%, and then it's much smaller. Here is the density of the external medium and the spectrum of the accelerated particle. On this side, you can see the S gamma ray bursts. So these are X ray data from XRT. And here you can see the magic spectrum. So in this paper, they try two different interpretations synchrotron plus synchrotron set quantum, and it doesn't seem to work. And then they propose something different that is one single synchrotron component that goes from X-ray to the TV uh, domain. Of course, this interpretation implies that we need to build a new theory for particle acceleration, because with synchrotron radiation, you are expected to be able to reach these energies here. You see this cutoff, you see the fact that electrons can be accelerated up to a maximum energy, and this will result into a maximum synchrotron frequency that is expected to be here. If we want to extrapolate the synchrotron up to the energy, we need um, to come up with an idea to um, accelerate electron to much higher energy. So uh, the interpretation that we give here really affect our uh, results on particle acceleration. However, the interpretation of this gamma reverse is debated. So in this uh, paper here, we try for the same gamma reverse, the synchrotron plus FXC interpretation. And as you can see, we are able to model the TV as data with the synchrotron set on so with parameters that are similar to those that we use to interpret the magic gamma reverse in particular. The fraction of energy that goes in the magnetic field is quite a small. So there are more and more indications that this parameter is smaller than we thought. Okay, so what we have learned, we have learned that the energy emitted in the very high energy range is similar to the energy emitted at lower frequency. In a synchrotron set Compton interpretation, this means that the energy that I put in the inverse Compton component is similar to the energy that there is in the synchrotron component. Um, we observe that the very high energy emission can be produced both by energetic and sub-energetic gamma reverse. So maybe it's something common to most uh, gamma reverse, but can last for days. A uh, synchrotron set quantum is always a viable explanation, of, uh, even though people try to uh, propose and test also other explanations for this emission, like external quantum. Um, and then, uh, lack of observations are quite fundamental uh, to show what's going on between the X ray and the TV if there is a dip in the spectrum that will mark the uh, evidence for a double peak SED. Open questions on general the origin of this emission is still debated by the community. And then there are two open questions that are more observational challenges. So very, uh, there is very high energy emission also during the prompt. I remark the importance to answer this question. And the second one is, 
it also sharp gamma ray bursts have um, properties and the conditions to produce a detectable variable energy uh, flux. So these are probably questions for the next generation of giant box telescope. So here you can see a comparison between the sensitivity of MAGIC and S with the upcoming CTA, um, which is the Cherenkov Telescope Array. So for gamma ray bursts, we always thought that the large size telescope, those sensitive here, were the most important telescopes. But now we know that emission from gamma ray bursts arrive at least to a few TV, so in this energy here, where the MSTs are um, very important. And why not? Maybe also uh, we can hope to see gamma ray bursts with the SST, the small size telescope, which are sensitive uh, above more or less one TV. Here are some simulations that we perform for the Astrimini array, which is a, an array of nine telescope that is going to be uh, built uh, uh, soon. So here we take the magic gamma ray bursts as a template and show uh, that Asimini array would have been able to detect it. And this is the spectrum uh, of 1901-14C, so we only add one point. But if we move the gamma ray bursts to lower redshift, 0.25 and 0.08, then uh, you see that we can reconstruct the spectrum and detect with a large significance the gamma ray bursts. Of course, to put such an energetic gamma ray burst at low redshift uh, seems at the time quite a stretch because we don't expect to have very energetic gamma ray burst in a small volume. But then one month ago, we detected this gamma ray burst, which is even more energetic, and this at low redshift, so totally unexpected. So the redshift is 0 0.15, and uh, the energy detected during the front emission was between 10 to the 54 and 10 to the 55 Earth. So here you can see comparison with other gamma ray bursts. Here there is the energy in units of 10 to the 54 Earth, and here the redshift. So this recent gamma ray burst is somewhere here. For the energetics, you see that there are other gamma ray bursts detected with um, similar energetics. And the redshift is in this region here. So we have very few gamma ray bursts detected below redshift 0.2, longer gamma ray bursts. And this burst here was in the intersection of these two very peculiar uh, ranges. So a very, very unexpected and rare event. Um, this is the front light curve. So Fermi GBM triggered on something small here. And then um, there was some background emission. And then you can see again the main emission from this gamma ray bursts that was uh, really huge. And the GBM has saturated. So uh, this light curve and the spectra are really affected by how bright was this gamma ray burst. A uh, lap of uh, the instrument sensitive uh, between 0.1 and 100 GV was also observing the gamma ray burst during the front emission, and they detected a photon at 100 GV. So, this is the first time that we have such energetic photons detected during the front emission. Uh, unfortunately, also lap is affected by from by lap. So we need to wait to see if data can be recovered to understand the origin of this very high energy photon during the prompt emission of the gamma ray burst. Okay, then uh, of course the optical emission was detected by many, many telescopes. So just being detected in X-ray, optical, radio, LAC was observing also during the, um, the afterglow. And then the filter was this uh, amazing detection by LASO, the first time that LASO detected a gamma ray burst 
Um, so they say that in the first 2000 seconds, they detected more than 5,000 photons at energies above 0.5 TV, and reaching a maximum photon energy of 18 TV. So it is definitely the record holder for um, the, the photon energy of the burst. And then there are also observations by Oak, Ice Cube, and Ventring, but unfortunately they have only after links. Okay, so you might have noticed on the archive a series of papers uh, in the last month about this gamma burst. So I'm going to explain why. The reason is this 18 TV uh, photon. <clears throat> We don't know exactly when it has been detected because um, the publicly available information only says that it was detected within the first 2,000 seconds. Here I mark the duration of the prompt emission, so the prompt emission stops here. Here is where last detected is 100 GB photon. Here you can see last uh flaps uh, during the front and later on during the afterglow the extra key of the gallery radio like the look or very very standard and in fact in this paper they are interpreted with this model that is a simple afterburn model okay so what was very interesting is that is this photon with this very large energy and why it is so interesting well, because we said that at this energy, the extragalactic background light is going to affect the flux from the source. So here you see the attenuation factor that we expect from uh, this EDL model. This is the model from Dominguez 2011. So um, at low energies, let's say below 1 TV, the attenuation is very small. Here there is no attenuation, the factor is 1. Then you start to attenuate the flux, and then here you have this cutoff. And uh, but the 18 TV photon is here. So you expect a huge attenuation factor, something around 10 to the minus 8, to be applied to the flux um, to calculate the flux that can reach the earth. Um, okay, so if you change a little bit the energy, you see that the attenuation factor changes by several orders of magnitude. The point is that we are after this uh, cutoff. So what we predict for the attenuation strongly depends on the energy of the photon and also on the error on the ideal model. So you see that there are that there is a huge uncertainty actually on the expected attenuation. But in any case, the attenuation also in the best case is very, very strong. So people start to say that it was impossible to detect this gamma, this photon from a gamma reverse at redshift 15. And so I counted so far 28 papers on the archive posted on one month. And uh, I try to classify them depending on the subject. So 10 of them discuss ARPS, the ARP scenario, ARPS are axion like particles. So it's a theory where the photon, in presence of a strong magnetic field, uh, oscillates between the status of photon and the axion like particles. So, uh, of course, when it travels as an axion like particle, it's not affected by the EBL. Then when we uh, when we reaches the our galaxies, um, in presence of the magnetic field of our galaxies is reconverted into a photon. So in this way, um, this scenario can explain why these TV photons have not been uh, absorbed um, by uh, the EBL as expected. Then there are six papers discussing Lorentz invariance violation. And in particular, the modification to the threshold for pair production. So um, uh, TV photons are uh, expected to do pair production uh, in interaction with the EDL. Uh, but uh, uh, if you account for this supposed 
anomaly introduced by Lorentz invariance violation, you can explain why um, you have a different ratio and then, then your photons can survive. <laughs> then there are papers discussing this emission as secondary from anti energy cosmic rays. There are papers discussing sterile neutrinos, galactic lenses. Ionospheric disturbance that was observed in coincidence with these gamma reverse, and only three uh, papers discussing gamma reverse physics. So, sorry. So, as you can see, most of the interest of finding this gamma reverse was about this photon and was about uh, what we can learn on astroparticle physics, extension of the standard model. Lorentz invariant violation and also constraints on EDL or intergalactic magnetic field. <laughs> okay, I leave you with this question. So this is my I like two slides. So is this 18 TV photon really problematic? Of course, to answer this question, we need to know the intrinsic flux at the source and the spectrum. Uh, we need to know the EDL model, and here you see a table discussing different EDL models and different predictions. Um, we need to know the level sensitivity because we need to know the intrinsic flux absorbed by EDL and then compare to the level of sensitivity to decide whether or not it was possible to observe the problem. We need to know the energy resolution because we saw that by changing a little bit the energy of these photons, the um, absorption factor is completely different by orders of magnitude. And also the time of the detection, because of course it's more difficult to uh, explain this photon if it was detected at 2000 seconds. It's a bit easier if it was detected at 200 seconds where fluxes are expected to be higher intrinsic plastic. Okay, so this is a study where they simply extrapolated the last spectrum to the TV range, applied the uncertainty, uh, considering all different EDL models, and then they um, use the uh, level sensitivity to estimate the number of expected photons above 500 TV, and we should get something around 5,000, 5, this is the number given by LAVO, and about 18 TV. And you see that predictions are very different depending on the EDL model that we choose. So this means that once we have the data, we can maybe constrain, put some constraints on EDL model. Of course, we don't know if the 18 TV is related to this last component. So this is just a rough estimate of what could have been the intrinsic flux. Another possibility studied here is to apply a theoretical model. So decide that these 18 photons is related to afterglow emission, model the synchrotron afterglow radiation, X-ray optical, and estimate the associated SSC component. Uh, absorbed with a EDL model, in this case, or it's looming at the start of 2011, and compare with the last of sensitivity. The results here is that uh, we are right at the threshold or a bit below. So it's very difficult to, um, um, to explain the observation of this um, 18 TV photon. But again, it is an SAD average over 2,000 seconds. If the photon was detected at every time, we should this SAD uh, up, and again, uh, we need to test uh, different EDL models. So we still don't know the answer. I guess we should expect, uh, uh, wait for the uh, final results. And um, I hope I gave you a, some um, basic background to interpret all these papers that are uh, being published on the archive every day. And thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Lara. Questions? Yes. Should you make the transparency with the two events, the first four events? What is surprising is that uh, 
you seem to have two regimes in the time, time delay 3.6 time of minus 4, and then 56 and 57. Yeah, no, I think this is just observational. So magic is very fast in uh, pointing the target. So there are several gamma ray bursts observed by magic even in the earlier times. And here, um, so the point is not that there is no detection before this, but this is the time when S reached the source, pointed the source, mm -hmm. and uh, and immediately there was the detection. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, on this part, uh, on this table, you mentioned that one is low energy, but so this is the isotopic emission, assuming that what you see is just representative of. So, couldn't it be just that? This low energy one you see from the age, and so you think the the isotopic luminosity is small, but in fact, um, yes. So actually, uh, in this paper here, we test also this possibility. This is exactly that gamma ray burst, but there is no evidence that it was observed. Uh, uh, outside the jet or at the edges. Otherwise, you should have observed the very faint front emission and also some signatures in the early afterglow. So it seems a standard gamma ray burst detected uh, on axis or at least within the jet. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So again, on the table that you showed the earlier, it's just to be sure I understand uh, the C90 is the C90 of the front emission. Yes. And so you said that the, 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 the high energy radiation is uh, clearly uh, belonging to the afterglow. But then we see that two time delays correspond more or less to the front emission. So how? Yes, uh, this actually, uh, we should not believe uh, this number because. Actually, this is based on BAT or GBM, but in this case here, they were both able to detect also after blue emission. And so this uh, estimate of the duration of the prompt uh, is not uh, correct in my opinion, because you see here, you see the prompt light of this gamma reserve, the last part is here. And then all the lighters, including BAT and GPM, gave an hour loss in time. And here is 25 seconds. Uh, so instead, this estimate of 90, which is something um, that simply that doesn't look at the, the shape of the light curve, but simply the time when you accumulate 90% of your counts. Probably this estimate is including also all these counts here that are already after growth emission. So I would say that actually the duration of the prompt emission for this gamma reverse is 25 seconds and not 300. And I was also wondering about the time to uh, how you to, to screw the, the telescope after. Uh, it seems very fast, 57 or 56. So. Yes, so here the alert was received like 20 seconds after the trigger time, and the magic was able to, to point the target in around 30 seconds. I mean, yeah. they are sure that they didn't need any even because of the screwing time of the telescope. Sorry? They are sure that they didn't need part of the flood. Due to the time of the oh, yes, sure. So, this is when you start pointing the gamma ray burst, so you don't know at earlier times what, what happened. This is the difficulty of having um, uh, TV observations during the prompt that you always have this delay due to the slowing time to receiving the alert and then performing the. The pointing, uh, but it's not impossible because, for example, for many gamma reverse, there is a small pulse that you cannot even uh, see here because the scale is dominated by this. But uh, uh, instruments like BAT or GBM trigger on this 
a small um, episode that if your telescope start the, the zoom, they are able to observe the main event. Uh, so it's not impossible to have observations of prompt emission with sharing of telescopes uh, with IACTs during the, the prompt. In the beginning, you showed the, the problem of the low energy spectrum, which is minus one instead of minus one point five. Then you said, in some cases, there is a break. Yeah, like this kind of break. And this is roughly understood. But so this is only for a few geometry, right? So for the first study that we did, uh, where camera bursts were selected only on the basis that they have simultaneous uh, XRT observations, we find that in 65% of the burst, there is an identified uh, break. And then uh, we study the 10 brightest gamma ray bursts detected by GBM, so different instruments, and uh, eight of them, eight of the brightest 10 gamma ray bursts have this break. So it's so, quite common. So it's, it's uh, reasonable to assume that the minus one that you see in general is just a combination of this. Maybe, yes, yes, it's possible. This is what we, we suggest. Mm -hmm. It is a combination between. So when you don't have enough signal in this part of the spectrum, you just read with a single power law, yeah. which is, of course, harder than this. Yes. Yeah, and then you said, um, I remember well, that uh, to explain, uh, it was, uh, uh, you said you need uh, lower, yes, to have this break, I, I remember, uh, to have this break, you need lower uh, energy field so that it's not cooled very quickly. But then you have uh, inverse quantum, which goes stronger. Yes. Uh, but if you have, inverse quantum, then it has to be further away, and then you don't explain the variability. Yes, exactly. So the problem is this magnetic field is fixed by your by the observation of the break, by the location of the break. Uh, but then if you put this magnetic field here in this equation with standard values for the radius and gamma, you predict a huge inverse quantum It is somewhat attenuated by Kleinishina. Yeah. There is strong Kleinishina here, but this is still is very large. And we didn't detect this in LAT. So we cannot put constraints. It would be better to have deep constraints or observations, but from what we have from LAT, here we put a rough constraint on the luminosity of this uh, component, and then you are forced to move the emitting region to larger okay. distances. Mm -hmm. yes. But then, so the, and the problem is you, that is further away, then it just the, 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 the time crossing, the light curves, the light crossing the time. Yes, because it's you're emitting also. surface, yes. But do you observe the, the large variability also for these ones? Oh. Uh, this is a good question. So it's something that we still have to study. If there is a relation between the variability that we because see and the location, the presence of a break. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Those ones which have a break don't have such low variability. Yeah, yeah, this still can be explained. Yes, sure. So this has not been looked at yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thin uh, optical thin part of the spectrum. spectrum. It is understood that one. Is it compatible with the uh, uh, high energy part? It's compatible with the. Uh, so this is all optically thin. Okay. Yes, but after the. Okay, we after expect the break, absorption at even lower frequency. After the break, after the maximum. Compatible with the alpha ratio with the with the index of the uh, uh, ah you mean here the details? Yes. 
So uh, here we, we don't know what to expect for particle accelerations in this environment, because these are maybe reconnection, maybe mildly relativistic shocks, and we don't have a strong theory to say, okay, P must have this value. So it's more the other way around. So from observation uh, and uh, from the measure of theta, we infer the P value. It's not easy because uh, very often in this part of the spectrum, uh, this is a very nice case, but in most cases, there is no, not enough signal here to constrain the shape of this power law. But when we can do it, it seems that P is very steep. So three or even steeper than three. So this from the um, uh, electron spectrum is very, very, very steep which can be an input for, for models of acceleration in this environment. Yeah, just a very fast one. It just came to my mind. But uh, so to explain why you don't see a very high energy uh, SST component, couldn't you invoke uh, per production? Yes, there is also, also that, yes. But it, or, I mean... uh, it's still uh, not not enough. So the problem is that with this magnetic field, you really have a huge inverse quantum component, like several orders of magnitude. Um, so you really need to kill it. Um, and and the, the, the Klein machine and per production helps, but it's still too large if you just put the low density field in, in, uh, in the equation for the estimate of the synchrotron cell quantum. So you need to move this uh, emission to a, a larger distance. Coming back to the very quickly to the uh, Lasso do you know? I mean, do we do, but do you know for the moment if they have uh, a whole spectrum that we can provide, or they just said we, we have this huge event? No, so they said uh, that they have these 5,000 photons yeah. above uh, 0.5 TV. So and that's it. I I hope so. I think so, yes. So I think we will really see very nice data and lots of yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Very exciting because uh, yeah, whatever the spectrum is it will be extremely Yes, yes. Wow. Okay. Related to this I think TV, uh, is it not uh, very probable that it's 10 TV more than 18. What, what is the energy resolution? Because this attenuation of 10 to the yeah. is possible. So I heard that the energy resolution is around 20% at these energies. But it's yeah. <laughs> no, it changes really a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why I was listing here that the answer depends on the energy resolution and the energy. Yeah. I mean, the expected number of five and three for two of the models. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, yes. This and that is four or seven. Anything can go. And as you said, this can constrain a lot. Uh, Yes. That's fantastic. Really fantastic. Other comments? Okay, there are no comments on Zoom, so thanks a lot, Lara. Thanks. Thank you. So we now have coffee here and we come back. And if you organize a dinner with the speaker, so if anybody is interested to come, especially the young ladies, feel free. Just let us know so we know what you want.